today, we're kicking off a debate on major bipartisan legislation. Uh, Chairman Hatch and I are also involved in an important Senate Finance Committee hearing. He will be here uh, a little bit later. I would ask unanimous consent that our colleague, uh, Senator Durbin from Illinois, be allowed to speak after I do. I believe that his remarks will also be completed uh, before Chairman Hatch arrives. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Chairman Hatch and I will be managing this bill. And we also would like to say to colleagues that uh, we're anxious to have everyone have an opportunity to speak out on this extraordinarily important issue. And if they come down and uh, consult with uh, the finance staff, majority and minority in our respective cloakrooms, we're going to uh, work very hard to accommodate all of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Here, in my view, Mr. President, is what this issue is all about. Fiscal battles in the Congress come and go, but nothing should ever be allowed to threaten America's sterling economic reputation, and this legislation will preserve it. Without this agreement, the Congress is staring at a potential debt default, a debt default that would be literally days away and the Treasury would lose its authority to borrow in order to make payments. By now, I think a lot of senators understand the disastrous consequences of default. Housing costs shooting upward, retirement accounts shrinking, jobs disappearing, consumer confidence dropping. Now, we also understand that no one can get particularly thrilled by the prospect of raising the debt ceiling. Yet it is a job that must be done. Our country is an economic rock in tumultuous seas. And we certainly have disagreements. Disagreements practically come with every news cycle an election. But what doesn't change, Mr. President, is our country pays its debts and we pay them on time. That's why this legislation is so important. The bipartisan compromise reduces the threat of a potential government shutdown in December. When this becomes law, the pin, in effect, goes back in the grenade where it belongs. And that is positive news as we look for some predictability and certainty, which we all hear from our businesses and employers and our citizens is so important. Congress ought to look at this compromise, in my view, as a springboard to a full and productive debate over the budget in the upcoming two years. The fact is, last-minute deals have become too commonplace, and they've left a lot of important policy reforms, policy improvements, on the cutting floor. For example, with America's West getting hotter and drier each year, our broken system of budgeting for wildfires is in drastic need of improvement. The same goes for many programs and services that are a lifeline for rural America. Fortunately, this legislation lays the groundwork for the Congress to go back to having robust budget debates that can actually solve these challenges. Now, with my time this morning, I'd like to address some specific elements of the bill, starting with what I see as several particularly constructive uh, policies. First, the legislation staves off the full brunt of the automatic budget cuts known in the corridors of Washington as sequestration. This policy was designed, in effect, to be painful from the get-go, and it would weaken Medicare, the lifeline for older people, and other domestic programs. It was supposed to be considered so god-awful 
that it would vanish two years after it began, but it continues to haunt budget debates to this day. It's important that this legislation eases the burden by $80 billion over two years. That means more opportunities to invest in education, in medical and scientific research, in housing assistance, in public health, and more. Now second, this bipartisan plan is going to prevent a big spike in Medicare costs for millions of older people. Several weeks ago, the news came down that seniors were facing a hike in premiums and deductibles in Medicare Part B, the outpatient portion of Medicare, of potentially more than 50%. That would amount to an increase of hundreds of dollars, perhaps more, in a year when Social Security benefits are not expected to grow. From my years as co-director, of Oregon's Gray Panthers, I can tell you, for many seniors living on a fixed income, that would have really hit them like a wrecking ball. So when we got those initial reports, several of my Democratic colleagues and I got together and introduced legislation that would fully shield older people from this huge financial hit. Following our work, the bipartisan compromise before the Senate includes a version of this important fix. It is not as generous as the proposal my colleagues and I introduced. There are questions about how it will affect the landscape a few years down the road. But make no mistake about it, Mr. President, this approach goes a long, long way to protecting seniors, particularly the dual eligibles, seniors eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, and this is a very important part of this legislation. Third, the budget compromise takes an extraordinarily important step to shore up one of our country's most vital safety net programs, the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. Without a fix, what's called SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance Benefits, that the workers have earned, they would have been slashed by 20%. And that 20% hike would have hit those uh, affected very quickly. This proposal is going to follow what has been a frequently used bipartisan approach of shifting funding within the Social Security program to make sure that those who depend on this program are protected through 2022. I introduced legislation earlier this year, along with 28 of our colleagues, which would have gone further by guaranteeing that the program remains solvent through 2034. But this compromise package, again, strengthens the program for several years and we'll have a chance to come together, hopefully on a bipartisan basis, and go even further. Fourth, the budget package makes real progress on what's called complying with our tax laws, tax compliance. And it's important to note, Mr. Chairman, these are, Mr. President, these are not tax hikes. This is a question of enforcing tax law so that when taxes owed are owed, they are actually paid. And in the tax compliance area, there are several important proposals that are going to crack down on taxpayers who seek to dodge their responsibilities and pass the buck to other Americans. For example, enforcing the tax laws with respect to large partnerships has been a challenge for some time. There are more than 10,000 of these complex businesses in our country. More than 500 of them have at least 100,000 partners. So there has not been an effective way to conduct audits under the current rules because the rules are basically current or decades old and haven't kept up with the times. In my view, the proposal before the Senate 
makes meaningful improvements here. More taxpayers will pay what they owe instead of using slate of hand approaches to dodge their responsibilities. We all understand that the tax code it almost boggles the mind in terms of its uh, complexity. And I think it would be fair to say that there may be more work that goes in to getting this uh, policy uh, right as it relates to partnerships and several of the other uh, issues. And my colleagues and I on the Finance uh, Committee intend to keep giving uh, the scrutiny that the partnership issue deserves a ongoing uh, analysis. Those are four specific areas of progress in this compromise that staves off a risky budgetary uh, battle. I do feel it's important to share one of my concerns with the bill at this time, and it's a provision that really has little to do with the budget. It's called Section 301, and it allows debt collectors to make robocalls directly to Americans' cell phones. Here's my view. Debt collectors should not be gifted broad permission to harass our citizens, particularly through robocalls running up costly charges in many cases. The Federal Communications Commission has limits on the number and duration of, uh, of calls, and they are not sufficient in a healthier budget process, this kind of proposal would get weeded out. So I'd like to say to our colleagues in the Senate, both Democrats and Republicans, I'm going to do everything I can to reverse this action in the weeks ahead. Finally, Mr. President, in my capacity as ranking member of the Finance Committee, I want to discuss how these fiscal agreements ought to be financed in the future. Medicare and Social Security absolutely cannot become the honeypots that Congress raids whenever it needs to pay for legislation. If you go around the country to Oregon, to Illinois, to Georgia, to the Dakotas, to Texas, and you ask typical Americans what they want their representatives in the Congress to do. Protecting Medicare and Social Security is right, right at the top of the list. I hear it in every town hall meeting. I've had more than 700 of them in my home state. And I've got to believe many colleagues in South Dakota and Illinois and elsewhere hear the same thing. There is a long-standing tradition that says changes in Medicare policy should be for strengthening Medicare in the future. The same principle goes for Social Security. Yet twice now, these vital programs have been used to fund budget deals and Medicare sequestration is sticking around long past its original expiration date. This legislation preventing a calamitous default is coming down to the wire. And I would tell colleagues this is a must-pass bill. I support it, and I would urge Democrats and Republicans to do so as well. I would also say as we talk about where we go from here, it is important to recognize that Medicare and Social Security must not be used as ATMs for other spending in the future. The bottom line has to be that the process of reaching a budget and keeping the lights on in this wonderful institution, the people's branch, keeping the lights on in the process of reaching a budget has to change. The Congress cannot continue to just go from crisis to crisis to crisis. It's our job as lawmakers, working in a bipartisan way to set the right temperature in our economy with smart, forward-looking policies that help our businesses succeed and give everybody in America, and I want to emphasize that, everybody in America, 
the opportunity to get ahead. Pretty hard to do when you lurch from one crisis to another. So let's use this legislation as an opportunity to get back to writing the budget in a bipartisan fashion through the traditional approaches that have been used, what's called you know, regular order, pass this bill now so as to ensure that America's sterling economic reputation is intact. And then let's look to the future around some of the principles that I have laid out. Again, Mr. President, uh, Chairman Hatch will be here uh, in a bit. He and I, as the managers of the bill, want to make it clear we want to try to accommodate as many colleagues as we can. We ought to be able to. And uh, I look forward to uh, the remarks of uh, the distinguished senior senator from, uh, from Illinois. And uh, I believe uh, before uh, too long, Chairman Hatch will be here as well. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor.